before we go into a nasal lesions or ovarian lesions specifically, it's important for us to remind ourselves on what the normal ovary looks like. The corpus luteum is part of the normal ovary. So it is not considered a lesion, but because the corpus luteum is a great sonography mimic, it is important for us to stress a point or two regarding the appearance of corpus luteum so that we don't misdiagnose a normal physiology for a lesion. Functional cysts are the commonest benign cysts encountered in clinical practice, closely followed by hemorrhagic cysts. Hemorrhagic cysts are the leading cause of acute pelvic pain. These two group of cysts will resolve spontaneously, but these benign lesions will not resolve without intervention. At the end of this exercise, we should be able to differentiate between physiological appearances and pathological ultrasound appearances. We should also be able to appreciate the classic ultrasound appearances of the common benign ovarian lesions. All the images used for this presentation are cases managed in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of University of Medjugorje Teaching Hospital. In some literature, they call the common lesions the big five. Others call it the big six. I call it the big four. These are the big four lesions that we should be conversant with at the end of this webinar. As I said earlier, functional cysts are the common cysts encountered in clinical practice closely followed by hemorrhagic cysts, dermoid cysts, and endometrioma. So this is the big four I will dwell on in the next hour or so. For eight of these images are transvaginal images with a few transrectal images using transvaginal prop. The remainder are transabdominal images. Close to 80% of the images were obtained using handsets. So the quality of these images will largely depend on the quality of the handsets, whether it is made in Edo, Maiduguri, or Wuhan. Now, before we go further, it is expedient that we classify ovarian lesions based on standard terminologies. I chose the IOTA consensus because it is widely accepted and validated. A nasal lesion, as defined by IOTA, is any ultrasound assessment inconsistent with normal physiological function. For example, a persistent unilocular cyst. This is an example of a persistent unilocular cyst. A persistent cyst is inconsistent with normal physiology. What is consistent with normal physiology is for follicles to be recruited a dominant follicle is selected, the dominant follicle matures, ruptures and transforms into a corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum regresses and becomes corpus albicans. This is what is consistent with normal physiology. So if you have a persistent follicular cyst, it is an adnexal lesion. Occasionally, the corpus luteum may appear as a solid structure. This should not be confused with the lesion because corpus luteum is a normal physiological function. A septum is a thin strand of tissue that runs from one end of the cyst wall to the other. It can be complete, as seen in this case of endometrioma, or incomplete, as in this case of hydrosalpins. A solid tissue is a tissue that exhibits high echogenicity, which is suggestive of the presence of tissue, like the myometrium, the fibroma, or a fibroid or an ovarian stroma. When there is doubt as to whether a lesion is solid or blood clot, the lesion should be classified as solid. That is the IOTA consensus. Take the worst case scenario. If you are in doubt 
as to whether the lesion is blood clot or solid tissue, there are two things that you can do. You can push the lesion using the transvaginal probe. If it moves, that suggests that what they're dealing with is blood clot. When you apply color, blood clot will not take color. So this way you can differentiate between blood clot and a solid tissue. I also emphasize the use of transvaginal ultrasound scan, but in my practice, and I believe in the practice of many in developed societies, it will be foolhardy to rely solely on transvaginal ultrasound scan. Why? Because a good number of our patients present late, and the masses are far beyond the purview of transvaginal ultrasound scan. So what I do is first of all to do a transabdominal ultrasound scan. Get a panoramic view of the pelvis before doing a trans vaginal ultrasound scan. This is particularly important in beginners. If you do a trans abdominal ultrasound scan before doing a trans vaginal ultrasound scan, and you discover that the uterus is antiverted, and on trans vaginal on trans vaginal ultrasound scan, the uterus appears retroverted. That will suggest to you that there's a problem with your with your prop orientation. On the other hand, if you take a lesion on the right side on transabdominal ultrasound scan, I will now discover that the lesion is on the left side on transvaginal ultrasound scan. That suggests that there's a problem with how you manage your prop. So it's important to use transabdominal ultrasound scan as a complementary scan to transvaginal ultrasound scan in this part of the world. Solid papillary projection is any solid projection into a cyst cavity from the cyst wall that measures greater than three millimeters, as you can see, in this case of advanced ovarian cancer in a 25 year old. Remember, a papillary projection is a solid tissue. When it measures less than three millimeters, it is called wall irregularity, not papillary projection. In about four to 20 percent of cases of endometrioma, you will find what is called the endometriotic slash. This slash should not be confused for a solid tissue because it is not a solid tissue. In this regard, you term this wall as irregular, not solid tissue, because solid tissue by definition, I beg your pardon, papillary projection by definition is a solid tissue. So this is not a papillary projection. This should be considered as wall irregularity. Acoustic shadowing is defined by Ayota as loss of acoustic echo behind a sound absorbing structure. This is an example with a dermal cyst. You can see this echogenic area. Behind it, you can see this dark area. This is called acoustic shadowing. This what is also called tip of the iceberg in dermal cyst. Ascites is fluid outside the porch of Douglas and is recorded as either present or absent. This is ascites in a patient with advanced ovarian cancer. You can see the uterus is literally flooded. Deposit in the zygmoid, deposit on the fundus of the uterus, and deposit in the cervical patch. Color flow is classified into four. Color score of one to four. There is no color score of zero. Color score one means there is no color flow at all. Color score of two, minimal color flow. Color score of three, moderate color flow. Color score of four, abundant color flow. Whenever you are using color Doppler, remember to use the appropriate Doppler settings. It's extremely important, especially the PRF. It should be between 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. This is a case of serocyst adenoma. We don't expect the receptor to take color. This is a polycystic ovary. Usually the stroma of the poly polycystic ovary is more vascular than that of a normal ovary. You can pick the blood flow from the, the tree or the menstrual cycle in case of polycystic ovary. But in normal cycle, it's hardly, blood flow is hardly picked before the day eight of the cycle. This is a case of adult granulocytial tumor. This is the blood flow we expect. Yeah, when you look at this uterus, you can see that the architecture is completely distorted. This is a case of choriocarcinoma, and this is the blood flow we expect in case of choriocarcinoma. Iota classifies ovarian tumor into five. 
Il le classique, il le classe solide, moitié le classique, moitié le classe solide, à solide tissu. Et il y a le classique, il se cisse without septé, without any measurable solid components of papillary projection, as you can see here. Et il y a le classe solide, il se cisse, il se classique, with a measurable solid component of papillary projection. A multilocular cyst is a cyst with at least one, except two, without any measurable solid component of papillary projection. A multilocular cyst is a multilocular, uh, sorry, a multilocular solid cyst is a multilocular cyst with at least a measurable solid component of papillary projection. A solid tumor is a tumor where the solid component make up 80% or more of the tumor when assessed in two-dimensional setting, as you can see in this case of adult granulosa cell tumor. Not classifiable because of poor visualization, as you can see in this case of dermoisis with extensive shadowing. These are the other classification system, but as I said, the IOTA stands out and is the one that is validated. This is the most recent by the Americans, published in 2018. Now, the normal ovary. The normal ovary is ovoid in shape, like a desert, dead. What is important for me to emphasize in this slide is that the morphology of the ovary is more important than the volume of the ovary. But you can imagine the volume of the ovary on the third of the cycle will not be the same with the volume of the ovary on the 14th of the cycle. During the prepubertal years and the postpartum period, it may be difficult to identify the ovaries. What makes the ovaries easily identifiable are the follicles. Again, in women who are hysterosomized, it may be difficult to identify the ovaries. So what I do is to locate the iliac vessels, which is very easy to locate. Once you locate the iliac vessels, overlying the iliac vessels, you find the ovary. This is a postmodern person a woman, as you can see the ovary, ovoid in shape and homogeneous. This is what you expect in a postmenopausal woman. So the iliac vessel will serve as a GPS for us to locate the ovary in difficult cases. IOTA also classifies six contents into five. Anaquaic, low level, ground glass, hemorrhagic, and mixed echogenic. And these are the examples. Example of a fossilized cyst, what aura describe as simple cysts, you can see the content is clear, thin wall, very good sound transmission. Here you have low level echoes as in missional cysts at the normal. Here the content is, packed, is closely packed together. That is why it appears as ground glass appearance. This is commonly what you see in endometrioma. But hemorrhagic cysts has varying contents depending on the age of the hemorrhage. And this is the moist with areas of mixed echogenicity. When it comes to polycystic ovary syndrome, there are so many contentions regarding the number of follicles. And for many of us who do translucent ultrasound scan, 12 follicles probably is not enough to make a diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome. But what is not in contention is the thick echogenic stroma. This patient's testosterone level was 3 nanogram per deciliter. Upper limit is 0 0.8. Her FSH LSD she was 5.661. She was T sweet, like T megary. And uh, she developed follicular atresia after 150 milligrams of chlorophyll citrate. Look at these follicles. It got arrested at 14 millimeters. This follicle is unhealthy. Why? It has thin wall. The walls are echogenic and irregular. When you apply color, you can see that there is just a dot here around the follicle. So this is an unhealthy follicle. These are not the 20% cases of women who have polycystic ovaries, but they menstruate normally. No, these are patients actually who presented with either infertility or menstrual disorders. So these are all cases of confirmed polycystic ovary syndrome, except this. Now, what is interesting here is that this is the same patient having a peripheral type of polycystic ovary syndrome in one ovary and a generalized type in the other ovary. What is also important for me to, to stress in this slide 
is how to differentiate between a polycystic ovary and a multicystic ovary. A multicystic ovary usually has a thin stroma, unlike the thick and echogenic stroma in polycystic ovary syndrome. The corpus lithium is not a lesion. So why did we create a niche for it? This is because the corpus lithium can masquerade as an endometrioma. It can be mistaken for an abscess. It can mimic the neoplasm. And in fact, it could be confused for an ectopic pregnancy. These are images of corpus lithium. This is a young corpus lithium. As, as you can see, the content of the follicle has not completely emptied. And uh, the literature shows that the, corpus, the content empties between one and 10 minutes after ovulation. You can see the wall is thick. But somewhere here, you can note some irregularity, suggesting that this may be the site of follicular rupture. If you apply, apply colodopla, you see this typical ring of fire appearance. But this ring of fire appearance only appears from 48 to 72 hours after follicular rupture. So early on, you may not be able to see ring of fire. When you apply spectral doppler, this is the, the resistance pattern you expect. It's a low resistance flow with good diastolic flow. But as the corpus lithium ages, the resistance will also increase. This is another corpus lithium, not the thick wall here. Somewhere here, you can see an irregular area. So this is the point of rupture. The point of rupture is easily identifiable when the corpus lithium is less than a week. Beyond that, if you see lava, you may not be able to identify area of rupture. So you can tell the age of the corpus lithium if you are able to pick the area of rupture. Of course, this is an old corpus lithium, because if you look at the lifespan of the corpus lithium about 10 days, so by the time you have a corpus lithium that is eight days old, it's an old corpus lithium. This is a corpus lithium that appears as a solid lesion. So this could, could be mistaken for a lesion, while in the actual sense, it's consistent with normal physiology. So this should not be reported as a lesion because it's normal. Of course, when you apply color, uh, corpus lithium has good color flow. If you, if you doubt that, when next you encounter a corpus lithium, try playing around, around it and you understand what I'm talking about. Functional cysts are the commonest cysts encountered in clinical practice. This cyst will resolve spontaneously without any intervention. In majority of cases, this cyst will disappear within six weeks. This is an example, usually thin wall, clear content, has very good sound transmission. This is a corpus tissue, and you can see a follicle here. And within the corpus tissue, you can see so a congenital area representing luteal cells. This is a rare manifestation or a rare appearance of corpus tissue, appearing as a double follicle. As studied, you can see this is a corpus tissue and this is a follicle. So appearing as a double follicle. Thicker luteal cyst is also a form of a functional cyst, commonly seen in complete modern pregnancy. This is what is described as snowstorm appearance uh, by Western authors. But in my book, I describe it as honeycomb appearance because that is what we are familiar with. The, the septae are usually thin, Contents usually clear, as you can see here. Here, sometimes the wall may be, may be thick, clear content. This is another case of thick luteal cyst. But what is of interest to me here is that if you look at somewhere here, you see a solid tissue. And you can see some, some anechoic areas here. This is part of the ovary. So, this should not be reported as multilocular solid tissue, no. The ovary is not considered to be a lesion. The ovary should not be reported as a solid structure. So this is actually a multilocular cyst, not a multilocular solid cyst. This is the importance of, of using standardized terminology. So that if I report this in my degree as multilocular cyst, someone in the adult should also report it as a multilocular cyst, not as a multilocular solid lesion. This patient presented two weeks after suction evacuation with lower abdominal pains. 
And we realized that these seeds that were unequate, some of them now contain some ecogenic area. So just think to us that the cause of the pain was hemorrhage in the cyst. Remember, there are three conditions that will give you acute pain in patients with decadural cysts. One is rupture, two is hemorrhage, three is torsion. This patient does not have features of rupture, there were no features of torsion. So we managed her conservatively as a case of hemorrhagic cysts. She got better and was discharged. Not so for these patients, whose ultrasound scan image was mistaken for bowel obstruction. And she was taken to a theater only to discover that what she had was actually thicker luteal cysts. But again, if you look at this image clearly, it's not different from these images. The appearance of thicker luteal cysts is classic. You see a picture like this in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and even in normal pregnancy. If you look at this, the contents of this cyst, they are clear. Bowel will not have clear contents. If you are patient enough, you see evidence of peristalsis, this bowel. And again, if you apply pressure, bowel will collapse. So there are, still, there are ways you can differentiate between bowel and cysts if you are in doubt. But again, if you are in doubt, please call for help or ask for a second opinion. Corpus hemorrhagicum. In some studies, it is the commonest cause of acute pelvic pain. What is important to emphasize in this slide is that hemorrhagic cysts initially appear as solid tissue. So early hemorrhagic cysts will appear as a solid tissue, but then it has excellent sound transmission. One way you can distinguish between a cystic structure and a solid structure is that cystic structures give distal enhancement or good sound transmission, while solid structures do not. If you see distal enhancement within a solid tissue, then there are cystic components within the those, these tissues. This is an important feature to note. It doesn't matter whether the cyst is physiological or pathological. The bladder will give distal enhancement. The gut bladder will also give distal enhancement. A hemorrhagic cyst will also give distal enhancement. A fibro will not. A fibroma will not. A hemorrhagic cyst will not take a color. So the color score will be one. If you apply prop, the content of the cyst will jiggle or will move. Like functional cysts, hemorrhagic cysts are almost always unilocular cysts. They are almost always unilocular cysts. There is no way you can convince anyone that this equation is a simple equation. It's not. This is a complex equation. And this is the report we get most times when patients have corpus hemorrhagicum. The diagnosis usually is complex adnexal mass or complex ovarian mass. And one thing that I would like us to take home today is that we should avoid the use of complex adnexal masses. Let us be specific about what we have observed on ultrasound scan. Measure the size of the lesion in three dimensions. Describe the, your findings. Describe the internal content of that cyst. Describe the wall. Apply color and give possible differential diagnosis. The physician who referred the patient has taken a history, examined the patient. He also has his or her differential diagnosis. So as a sonologist, what to do, what you need to do is to help the clinician in arriving at a reasonable diagnosis. But by making a diagnosis of complex ovarian cysts, you are making the life of the physician complex, the life of the patient complex, and in fact, you are making your life complex too. No wonder ORAS now classified any cysts with an echo as not simple fluids, not as complex. What is the definition of a simple fluid? If the fluid is anechoic, it's simple by definition. But if there is any echo within the fluid, it is considered complex in those days. And that is what many still use to describe a nasal lesions. But ORAS in 2018 came out with this explanation. Fluid containing internal echoes should be defined as not simple fluid, but we should go beyond that and describe 
exactly what we observe on other sounds can. Before you do that as a sonologist, it's important to obtain a, a, a brief history from the patient. How old is the patient? What was her last menstrual period? What are presenting complaints? Has she had any other sounds can before? This information will guide you in arriving at a reasonable diagnosis, not reporting any other lesion in the admix that would echo as complex ovarian masses. This is a hemorrhagic cyst. It has internal echoes. So by those definitions, it's complex. This is a mucinous cyst adenoma. It has echoes. So by that definition, it's complex. This is an endometrioma. It has echoes. So by definition, it's complex. This is a dermoisis. By that definition, it's complex. So when you report a lesion as a complex, you, you, you are not adding any value to patient management. Because all of these cysts are really complex. The only one that is not complex per se is the functional cyst. So there is no point reporting admissal lesions as complex lesions. At times, we hide under our ignorance and reel out so many differential diagnoses. All the differences that you can think of will come out as, a dif as differential diagnosis. That will not help us in our patient management. What we can do is to describe exactly what we've seen on our transfer scan. For instance, you have a 25-year-old who presents with certain onset of, of lower abdominal pain. And our last menstrual period was two weeks earlier. And then you find something like this with a thick echogenic ring and a fissured appearance. Once you make that description, the clinical, clinical knows that what you are dealing with is hemorrhagic cyst. But by the time you classify the cyst as complex, you are making things difficult for everybody. The contents of hemorrhagic cyst is variously described as honeycomb, cobweb, fishnet, or threat like appearances. This is an example of a hemorrhagic cyst. You can see the wall is thick. Usually, the wall of hemorrhagic cysts are thick. Usually, the walls are thick. Look at this content looking as a solid tissue. But if you look at here, you see distal enhancement. Why? Because most of this content is cystic. Somewhere here, you can see an echogenic area. This is cloth retraction. Cloth retraction is beautifully defined by ORAT as a vascular echogenic component with angular, straight, or concave margins. Tissues hardly have concave margins. And blood clots transits from clot formation through to clot lysis, retraction, and resolution. So this hemorrhagic cyst is, has a retractile component. So it's in the process of retraction. These are five patients, all presented with sudden onset of lower abdominal pain, and all of them have hemorrhagic cysts at various stages. Thick wall cysts, retricular patterns within the cyst content. Here you can see a thick, a thick wall cysts with retricular pattern, and you can see an echogenic area here representing the tractile clot. Here, not the thick wall cysts, the fishnet appearance of the cyst wall, and the retractile clot here with stretch margin here. Thick wall cysts with floating echoes. Thick wall cysts with retractile clot. If we push on the prop, the content will jiggle. See that? Solid tissue will not jiggle. Blood clot will. Again, if you apply color doppler, Blood flow will not take color. What you've seen here is motion artifact. It's not color score of four. Remember, Doppler is all about movement. Not this thick wall cyst with very good sound transmission. Somewhere you can here you can see retractile clot. Not this unequal area here. So when I apply color, it has taken color. So the wall of the cyst will take color, but the content of the cyst will not take color. Look at this content here. There is no color flow here, but there is color flow to the wall. This is a magnified view 
of the image I shown you earlier is a case of ectopic pregnancy with hemorrhagic cyst. Look at the thick wall cyst here, and not the typical honeycomb appearance of this hemorrhagic cyst. But somewhere here, you can see an echogenic area that has a straight line. So this is clot in retraction. This patient presented in the first trimester with low abdominal pains of two weeks duration and dizziness with an ultrasound scan report of a solid ovarian mass. When I was told about it, of course, I was thinking about a malignancy. But when we repeated the ultrasound scan, we realized that, yes, there is what looks like a solid mass here, but it has good sound transmission. Good sound transmission is a feature of cystic structure, not a feature of solid structures. Somewhere here in the lower segment, you can see subcoronic hemorrhage. Of course, this is the internal os and the placenta. I don't worry about these 10 weeks. When I apply color doppler, I beg your pardon, power doppler, you can see the ring of fire appearance here. The solid, the corpus lithium is solid. And this area did not get color. Why? Because it is blood clot. The patient was managed conservatively and uh, she had a successful vaginal delivery. Hemorrhagic cysts with fishnet appearance sitting in the portion of Douglas. One week later, the cyst has dissolved. A cicla with the tritire clot. Four days later, there is diminution in the size of the cyst. By the third week, it has disappeared. This is a patient who had cystectomy on account of the cyst. She developed hemorrhagic cyst. Four weeks later, you can see clot in resolution. It's important for us to be able to differentiate, especially between a follicle and an early corpus tissue. There will be no difficulty differentiating between a follicle and a late corpus, uh, and a late corpus tissue. But we may have challenges differentiating between a follicle and an early corpus tissue. A follicle usually is thin wall, the wall is regular, the content is clear, and the blood flow is minimal. This is not the wall of the cyst. This is part of the ovaria stroma. This is early corpus tissue. The wall of the corpus tissue is thick because the wall is already euthanized. It could be regular or irregular, as in this case, where you see the area of follicular rupture. There will be some internal echoes, and you could see the point of rupture. Blood flow, fantastic. This is a gravian follicle with comorous ovulus. Comorous ovulus is seen in about 50% on transvaginal ultrasound scan and 20% on transabdominal ultrasound scan. When you see comorous, it suggests that in the next 24, 30 hours, the woman is likely to ovulate. So to me, the appearance of the comorous looks like the ultrasound scan equivalent of IH such. Now around, around this time when the comorous appears, this is when you have the peak of estrogen production. And that is when you get this clear cervical mucus. As you can see here, the cervical mucus is clear. So it's consistent with the other cells can appear. So right here, you can see some dispersal of the granular cells from the tissue cells. These are features of eminent follicular rupture. Now, if you follow these patients and the follicle phase rupture, the wall thickens, and you can discover some echoes within, you can actually suspect that what this patient has is mutinized and ruptured follicle. All simple cysts are unilocular cysts, but not all unilocular cysts are simple cysts. This is a unilocular cyst. It is not simple. Why? Because it has something on its wall. So it's not a simple cyst, although it is a unilocular cyst. It is important for us not to confuse blood clots for papillary congestion. And again, we should not confuse the fibrin strands of hemorrhagic cysts for septa in cysts adenoma. These are the benign ovarian tumors we are going to cover. Any of these tumors can undergo torsion. There are three classic features of dermoid cysts. One, it is a solid cystic mass with low level echoes and heterogeneous content, the mixed echogenic mass. Number two, 
it has echogenic areas of calcification, fat, or hair. And lastly, the shadows. These are the three classic features of dermoid cysts. In 75% of cases, you have at least two of these in a dermoid. Not only for dermoid cysts, for the big four lesions you're talking about, you don't need more than a gray scale to make a diagnosis of the big four. In over 90% of cases, you can make a diagnosis of the big four with gray scale ultrasound scan alone. Dermoid does not take color with the proper settings. When a dermoid takes color, we are likely to begin with an immature dermoid or stroma override. Occasionally, the contents or appearance of dermoid could be mistaken for a homologous cyst or an endometrioma. When you have such a situation, it is not recommended to make absolute diagnosis. Measure the cysts in three dimensions, describe your appearance, apply color, and give possible differential diagnosis. This is not an abstract ultrasound scan. This is a fetal head. On this fetal head, you can see what looks like bright lines and dots spatting from the fetal head and floating in LIHO. Again, here you can see something similar. If you see this on a certain ultrasound scan, I believe no one would be in doubt that what you are dealing with is fetal hair. So if you see something similar, bright lines and dots, in an adnexal lesion. Please do not call it dermoid because that is what it is. Dermoid is the commonest benign tumor seen in children. Dermoid is mostly asymptomatic. For these three patients presented with recurrent lower abdominal pain. Dermoid is slow growing. In some literature, it says dermoid grows just one millimeter. But yeah, in another study that followed a patient for six to nine years, they found that dermoid grows by 1.8 millimeters per year, not centimeters. So dermoid is a slow growing tumor. This 10 year old presented with recorded low abdominal pain. You can see this echogenic area within the cyst with good sound transmission. Somewhere here, you can see asymmetric wall thickening. Asymmetric wall thickening is a feature of chronic torsion. But this was not found at surgery, probably because the ovary trots and the trots. And you can see these areas that was observed on ultrasound scan. This was the first scan of this 11 year old, this is a repeat scan. Here you can see what appears like this uh, dash dot, dash dot here. So do not doubt the fact that this is fetal here because this is what it is. And once you see a lesion, what you suspect is fetal here in the, in the next day, what is it? What else will the lesion be except the moit? Somewhere here, you can see this dot dust pattern is enmeshed within a less echogenic area. So this is a fat with hair. Somewhere here, I've numbered the follicles. You can see follicles here, and you can see ovarian tissue here. And between the follicle and the cis follicle, you can see a halo. This suggests that it will be easy to tease out this ovary. And of course, it was easy to tease out the ovary and surgery. So not the hair enmeshed in fat that was seen here. If what you've seen, on ultrasound scan, it's not seen at laparotomy. Then uh, you need to go back and have a second look. This is what is called dermoid ball. It's a rare appearance or a damn clinical manifestation or ultrasound manifestation of dermoid cysts. When you see this, this is called dermoid ball and it's patognomonic of dermoid cysts. Yes, dermoid ball is patognomonic of dermoid in 8 to 10 percent of cases, dermoid is seen in postmenopausal women. This was 54 year old who was managed for advanced cervical cancer. This was an incidental finding. Remember, a GPS overlying the GPS is the ovary. Here, all you can see is echogenic area. But somewhere here, if you look closely you see some dot, dash, dot, dash pattern. So just seeing that what you have here is fat and hair. Again, fat, 
fluid level. Here you can see the thick wall, the dermoesis, and laparotomy, thick wall, fat ball on after sound scan, fat ball and laparotomy. Ground glass appearance of cis content, blood cis content. So here you can see what we thought on after sound scan was another dermoid, but a surgery, we found that there was a, a loculation or past, which was confirmed by cytology. So if you are not follow, follow up this patient, as far as you are concerned, this was a multilocular dermoid. So it's extremely important to follow up patients if you want to increase your diagnostic yield. This patient presented in the second trimester of pregnancy. With lower abdominal pain, you can see this, this very good sound transmission. But somewhere here, you can see an echogenic area. And again, you can see an echogenic area here. Once I see an echogenic area, and I'm convinced that it's echogenic, I will make a diagnosis of dermoid with all uh, the confidence because I'm yet to see a dermoid cyst that does not contain an echogenic component. So I made the diagnosis of dermoid. Two years later, she presented with worsening low abdominal pain. And this was what we found. Here, uh, not that the fluid is anechoic. This is not what I expect if there's a fat ball here, except if the fat ball is contained within its own cyst. But of course, at laboratory, it was contained, so within its own capsule. And that was why probably this content is anechoic. In the other ovary, as you can see, this is the outline of the ovary. We saw echogenic areas. And as, as I told you earlier, once I see an echogenic area in the ovary, I'm convinced it's echogenic. I'll make a diagnosis of dermosis. So look at this echogenic ring. This is um, this ovary where this is, was inoculated. This is the other ovary where we saw this echogenic ring. When I cut the ovary open, fat balls. So once I see an echogenic area within the ovary, and I'm convinced it is echogenic, I will make the diagnosis of the moment without hesitation at all. The bright lines and dots. You can see here, here. Here you can see an echoic cyst with another fat ball within its own capsule. Somewhere here you can see bright lines here and thought. So suggesting that this is fat and here and a surgery, fat, and you can see here. Dermoid is bilateral in 10 to 50 percent of cases. As you can see, this is one of the church cases. This one is called Rokitansky nodule or dermoid plug. It also contains here cartilage. Somewhere here you can see a fat globule. These are reverberation artifacts. Bright lines and dots representing here. You can see thick bands behind which you have acoustic shadowing. This is what is called the tip of the iceberg sign. Fat fluid level is seen in about 30% of cases of dermoid. Here you can see fat echogenic or heterogeneous fluid component, bright lines and dots, shadowing. So all features of dermoids are seen in these patients, fat here and shadowing. But what is of interest here is that this is the bladder. This is supposed to be the position of the uterus. So you can see this cyst has occupied the position of the uterus and it said push the uterus down, look at the uterus. Now remember that malposition is an important feature of ovarian torsion. But this patient did not present with abdominal pains. Probably if you had gone back to ask father, we could get history of mild or minimal pain. Because in 50% of cases, the pain of torsion is minimal or mild. You know, this reminds me of a story we are told uh, when the 2012 floods happened. A family was displaced, and then the husband and the wife went their different ways. Three days after the husband did not find his wife, a neighbor whispered to him that the wife uh, is staying with a bachelor in the neighborhood. He went there and saw the wife in the kitchen. He asked the wife what happened. She says it was the flood water that pushed her from the house to the neighbor's house, and she's been there for three days. So if you see any structure in an abnormal location, Please ask questions. You may get one or two pointers that will give you an idea of what you are dealing with. Ovarian cysts 
complicates about one to two percent of pregnancies. This is one of such pregnancies. Presented with abdominal pains, the central area, which is difficult to define the myometrial wall here and the wall of this cyst. This suggests that there is dense attrition here between this cyst and the myometrial. Somewhere here you can see evidence of dense attrition. The contents of this cyst is neither here nor there. Echogenic areas here, hyperecho area here, hypoecho area. So it's difficult to make out the contents of this cyst. But when you look at somewhere here, you see an echogenic component. And generally, fat is light, so it floats. So when I saw that, I had no doubt that what we were dealing with is dermoid cyst, not based on this appearance, but based on this echogenic component of the cyst. A surgery, what did they find? Look at the fundus of the uterus here. This is the mass. This area of attrition here, look at the thick band of attrition. You can see the serosa of the uterus was even peeled in the course of trying to separate the attitions. The cyst structures in the course of surgery and the content surprisingly is pause. So we missed that, that the content was pause. So when I went back and reviewed the image, I realized that yes, this does not fit any recognized pattern. Echogenic area here, hyperechoic area, I guess so. It was because this is an infected dermoid. So it didn't present like the classical uh, dermoid. But anyway, this echogenic component gives it away. The way we're dealing with is dermoid. 17 year old presented with long standing history of lower abdominal pain. This is the trans abdominal ultrasound scan. You can see echogenic area here with shadowing. And this is a transceptor ultrasound scan. You can see echogenic area, dermoid, and it was confirmed a surgery. This is 11 year old girl that I showed earlier, just trying to play around with 3D. Uh, but I realized that uh, the 3D did not give me any, any information that I did not obtain on 2D, really. Because here the wall is smooth, yes, the wall is smooth. I can see that here. Fat ball, I've seen the fat ball here. Classification, I've seen shadow in here. Uh, here, I've seen it here. So, what other information do I, do I get actually from this 3D? Nothing much beyond what I obtain on 2D. As I said earlier, in over 90% of cases, we do not need more than a 2D ultrasound scan to make a diagnosis of the common benign adnexal lesions. Is this stroma override? This is the description of stroma override in the literature. It's a multilocular cyst with thick septations and increased vascularity. This is a multilocular cyst with thick septations. At the time I did this ultrasound scan, I didn't know that stroma override takes color. If I had known, I would have applied color and that probably would have strengthened my, my diagnosis and this patient declined surgery. But could this be stroma override? It's possible, but what you are sure of is, it is the dermosis. Now, look at these 15 images of dermosis that we have discussed. Is there any of these cysts or lesion that did not contain an echogenic component? Is there? Here, 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 echogenic component is there? So as far as I'm concerned, the single most important ultrasound appearance of dermoid is an echogenic component. I've not carried out any study anyway, but this is my personal experience. But at times, we feel confused, echogenic component component close to the ovary as bright lines and dots are misdiagnosed but it's normal as dermoid. This is a case of hemorrhagic that I showed you earlier. This is boil. So you can see bright lines and dots within the boil because the boil contains uh, air and air appears to be echogenic. So this should not be mistaken for dermoid. This is boil. Here you can see the ovary. You can see the border of the ovary clearly outlined. But here you can see bright dots here. But this is not within the ovary. This is outside, this is boil. So this should not be confused for a downward cyst. This, I think, is corpus albicans. This should not be confused for downwards. Studies in the West 
has shown that when you use only the echogenic components of a lesion to make a diagnosis of dermoid, you will be right only in 60% of cases. But when we use two components out of the three, then the positive predictive value is 100%. From my experience, I have not seen this. From my experience, if you have an echogenic component in a nasal lesion, and you are sure that it is echogenic, it is in excess of 90%. Some of the images I saw, I cannot pass them for that much because the echogenicity was in doubt. But they carried out a study. I did not carry out a study. I'm just using my personal experience. When we are growing up, in the town where I grew up, there were only two families with black and white television. The AMS house, uh, another house of a civil servant. So in the evening, we go and watch Indian films. And if I remember one of the films, the, the actor died. And the following day, we saw the actor in another film. They were asking ourselves, oh, but this man died yesterday, how come he appeared? That's the beauty of growing, growing up in a village. For us of us who grew up in the cities, I believe many watch Mr. B, the village headmaster, the new masquerade, and Kokoro are done using this type of television. So when you see the content of an anesthesia lesion that appears like this, it is most likely to be an endometrioma. This is what is called the ground glass appearance. When you see some echogenic foci within the wall of the cyst, it is called calcific stipulin. That is highly specific, but it's only seen in about 20% of cases of dermoid, I beg your pardon, of endometrioma. So when you see a ground, ground glass appearance and an echogenic dot within the cyst wall, you are most likely dealing with an endometrioma. Again, endometrioma has excellent sound transmission. Why? Because the contents are cystic or fluid. That is why it gives excellent sound transmission. Only cystic structures give excellent sound transmissions. Solid structures do not give sound transmission or distal enhancement. Dermoid cysts does not take up color. Endometrioma also does not take up color. But occasionally, if a woman with endometrioma becomes pregnant, the endometrium could be decidualized, and a decidualized endometrium will take up color. Ground glass appearance, endometrioma. Endometrial sludge seen in about 4 to 20% of cases. This is fat fluid level, old blood, new blood. Ground glass appearance, uterus, artitions, burn of artitions between the endometrioma and the fundus medullus. By the way, I need to scan a patient with endometrioma without associated artitions. I need to see one. This is endometrioma, endometrioma, and a thick bar of artition between one endometrioma and the other. This is called kissing ovaries. Kissing ovaries is a sonography soap marker for artitions. When you see kissing ovaries, it suggests that you have severe artitions. These patients had ultrasound scans somewhere else, and the report was complex at nasal mass, bilateral complex at nasal mass. So she was asked to do a CT scan. After the CT, she was still asked to do an MRI. Why? Because someone reported complex and nasal mass. When you put a problem, you say, well, but this is ground glass appearance. And she was managed was for that. Ground glass appearance, you can see this thick septum. This is not fat field level. Fat field level is usually a straight line. This is another cyst. So over here, you can see a cogenic area, a cogenic area here, and also here. Now, on, on rectal examination, there was uterosacral nodularity in this patient. And so we thought that this could represent uterosacral nodularity. This patient presented with sudden onset of oh, abdominal pains. Look at the uterus, artitions in the anterior wall, posterior wall. You can see the 
push of Douglas is obliterated. So this is actually a case of frozen pelvis, and that was what it was, a surgery. The sliding sign was negative. The sliding sign is when you put your transfer vagina prop here, you push the cervix. You expect the ethereal to slide over the bowel. If it slides, that means the sliding sign is positive. If it doesn't, it's negative. Here, it was negative. Why? Because they are tissues. Because of the severe partitions, the period is obliterated, and you can see this burst of partition. This is what is called peritoneal inclusion cyst. And there was site specific tenderness in this patient. Ultrasound scan today, especially transvaginal ultrasound scan, is an extension of uh, physical examination. You can determine site specific tenderness within the transvaginal prop. You can determine is the motion tenderness or is the tenderness using the transvaginal prop? And in fact, most importantly, in patients with suspected ectopic pregnancy, when you push the prop where the lesion is and there is no tenderness, please consider your diagnosis. If you push your prop against the lesion in a patient you suspecting as ectopic pregnancy and there is no tenderness, Please consider your diagnosis. 25 year old virgin presented with vulval swelling, which turned out to be an endometrioma, not a Bartholin cyst, but Bartholin abscess. This was an incidental finding. The mass was equivalent to 16 weeks size. Here you can see kissing ovaries. One of the ovaries here, the other one, you can see kissing ovaries. Somewhere here you can see echogenic lines here. This is calcific stipulin. When you, when you see calcific stipulin and grand granular appearance, you don't have to query. It is endometrioma. Somewhere here again, you can see thick band of attitions between this and the So this is another case of frozen pelvis, and that was what was found at surgery. Those who are interested in IVF would begin to ask questions. Why did we actually touch? Because as far as they're concerned, this is a don't touch lesion. But that is a discussion for another day. Kissing ovaries, bright lines and dots. This patient had a miscarriage of a two months of pregnancy, but after the cystectomy, she now has three children and she's still counting. In the court of the surgery, the cyst ruptures, and you can see the typical chocolate appearance. And that is why others call it chocolate cyst. This 28 uh, year old presented with a uh, what's in low abdominal pain. You can see this huge ground glass appearance. By the way, she was a virgin, so this is a transrectal ultrasound scan. So you can see this ground glass appearance and this echogenic foci within the wall, which is highly specific of endometrioma. So right here, you can see a thick band, a thick band of additions. We couldn't deliver, this is, you just had to manage. Is it all ground glass appearances that are endometriomas? No. That is why you can see the title. Ground glass appearance covered mTOR. This is ground glass appearance. But well, this is a case of transverse vaginal septum. So this is hematocolpus. This is a transverse ultrasound scan of a 13 year old. You can see the appearance, ground glass appearance. This is a case of imperforate hymen. This was the image I showed earlier of this endometrioma. You can see the ground glass appearance and the endometrial sludge. Here again, you can see the ground glass appearance with endometrial sludge. But this is not endometrioma. This is the same patient. Why? Because the pathogenesis is the same. It's blood collection within, within enclosed cavities. So not all ground glass appearances are endometriomas. So covert emptor. Endometriosis and adhesions. Kissing ovaries. Kissing ovaries. Kissing ovaries, obliterated POD. Dense pelvic adhesions. So ultrasound scan will actually help us in triaging patients so that we know which patients to allow the boys to play around with and which patients should be handled by the four-star general. And I believe you understand what I mean when I say four-star general. A four-star general in the hospital setting is a consultant. Cyst adenoma, the septations are usually regular without focal thickening. When the cyst persists more than five centimeters, and has thick walls, please suspect cyst adenoma. In 85% of cases of persistent cysts, it will turn out to be serious cyst adenoma. So if you bet that 
We are likely to win the bet in eight out of ten. That if it's a six percent more than five centimeters, it's likely to be a serous than a mucinous cyst adenoma. Serous cyst adenoma usually is unilocular, has clear content as you can see here, while mucinous cyst adenoma is usually multilocular and has low level echoes. This is a mucinous cyst adenoma, scattered, low level echoes. If we apply pressure here, the contents of this cyst will be seen to be moving from one end to the other. This is what is called streaming. Endometrioma will not stream because the contents of the endometrioma are densely packed together. So that is one way you can differentiate between a mucinous cyst adenoma and an endometrioma. But again, if you look at this wall here, it's just sitting on the there's there is no attrition. And I'm able to see an endometrioma, especially of this size, without attritions. This is a mucinous cyst adenoma. She was managed in surgical ward for appendicitis, and she came with the ultrasound called hypervarian cyst. We repeated the ultrasound scan and uh, not the distal enhancement of very good sound transmission here. Not the number of locus. When the number of locus is less than 10, it's associated with a benign condition. When it's uh, more than 10, it can be suspicious. But somewhere here, not the asymmetric wall thickening. This, like the patient with the dermoid, it's a feature of chronic torsion. This was confirmed by surgery. Of course, when you apply color, we don't, we don't expect this to take color. So the color score will be one. This is the same case of the serious mucinous adenoma showed earlier. She presented seven months after, after delivery, and we found that this is a size uh, mass, that is size mass. And uh, this was the weight and the uh, contents from the cysts. This we thought was a mucinous cyst adenoma, but histology said it's serous cyst adenoma, despite the fact that it's multi -locular. So it doesn't always follow. Now, this was a case of a double follicle that I missed two for cyst adenoma. But I asked the patient to come back for follow up. The patient came back at risk and it has disappeared. Follicles will disappear, cyst adenoma will not. When I went back and reviewed the image again, I realized that this looks to me more like a lambda sign. You look at it. And if you look at the tip of this arrow, you can see like there's an echogenic, an echoic area here. So you see that there are two leaves here, one here and one here. So to me, this is more like twin follicle than double follicle. So, sorry. So, when next I see this, I look at for this lambda sign and be sure that this is not a septal of cyst adenoma. Of course, when you apply color, I'm sure you'll be able to help. So, I mistook this for a cyst adenoma. In actual sense, it's a double follicle, or what I would like to call twin follicle. Just remember lambda sign. Fibroma is the commonest solid benign ovarian tumor. It could be associated with a classic mesh syndrome or with ascites. In this case, it was associated with ascites, not with the classic Meg syndrome. In 20% of cases of fibroma, you also have associated cysts, and this is uh, ovarian cysts with the crescent sign. When you see crescent sign, it suggests you that the cyst is intra ovaria, not the cystic, I beg your pardon, the solid nature of the mass. This is ascites. And somewhere here, you can see the fimbriae. A normal tube is not seen on today's ultrasound scan. But the ultrasound scan of the future may be able to pick. A normal tube, just like today's ultrasound scan is able to pick a normal ureter. Not the lobulated nature of this solid mass, also not the shadowing. Here you can see the color flow. The color flow to fibroma is usually poor, one or two. Why are you getting this abundant color flow? I think it has to do with this tube because the tube is adherent to this mass. So this blood flow is likely to be the flow to the tube, not to the mass. And that is what, the, why, what I believe is that this probably is the true color flow of this lesion. Now, this is a pedunculated uterine fibroid. Not the echogenic areas here, the echogenic areas here, not the shadow in here, and the shadow in here. Look at the uh, capsule, it's well encapsulated. Here, also well encapsulated. Did you know that there is no distal enhancement here? Not this time enhancement. Why? Because these are solid tissues. Solid tissues do not give distal enhancement.
It is said yes. that the shadowing of fibroma does not seem to originate from the area of increased echogenicity. Unlike what you see here in fibroid, this area of increased echogenicity, so shadowing, area of increased echogenicity shadowing. But I think it doesn't always follow. Because if you look at here, this area of increased echogenicity, and you can see shadowing here, so it doesn't always follow. What did you find as surgery? This was the cysts that we said uh, that can be seen in about 20% of cases of fibroma. You can see here. Then these are the solid components. You can see the solid component here, not the dobulation that we observed in the earlier uh, image, not the fimbre here. And this is the fimbre. And on cost surface, this is what we saw. The pathologists had difficulties making a diagnosis of fibroma. Why? Because they say they saw cess cuts elements and tubules here. So they thought it was either a metastasis or something else. But when I discussed with them, I told them, well, to me, this appears to be a fibroma. Because from the literature, what we know is that there are three conditions that give shadowing in the annexa. Damoid, fibroma, and cisadenal fibroma. This is not damoid. We have seen images of damoid before. This is not damoid. Could this be cisadenal fibroma? It's unlikely. Why? Because cisadenal fibroma commonly occurs in postmenopausal women, usually bilateral. And it's usually multicular solid tissue. And at times, it has papillary projections that give shadow. So I was convinced, I mean, 100%. Someone says, you cannot say 100%, but in this case, I would say 100%. I was convinced it was a fibroma. Because these are the three conditions that we know that give shadow in the anisa. At the end of the day, I think they consulted the literature and uh, they say, well, it has been reported that some fibromas contain sexual elements. So they now settle for fibroma. So it's good to collaborate. Uh, in such cases. Well, at times you could confuse a pedonculated fibroid for a, for a fibroma. But again, a pedonculated fibroid, as the name suggests, is pedonculated. So it has a connection. So you can test and get a pedicle. But occasionally, if it is parasitic, there, may do, there will be no pedicle. But again, if it's parasitic, you should be able to identify the ovary separate from the mass. This is a pedonculated fibroid. You can see the here. And you can see the pedonculated fibroid. Fibroid is usually hypoechoic compared to the myometrium. If you follow the uterine wall here, somewhere here, you can see an indentation here. This. Here, you can see indentation. So, suggesting that this is where the pedicle is. Yes, on 2D, it may be difficult to identify the pedicle. But when you apply color, you see this pedicle flow, and that will tell you that this is pedonculated uterine fibroid. Of course, as surgery, this is uh, fungus. Medical and the pedicleated uterine fibroid. Ovarian torsion complicates about 3% of, of, of uh, pregnancies, or so of emergencies. Uh, I beg your pardon. Torsion occurs at least five 